Hey everyone, welcome back. A very exciting study was just published. They gave people a radioactive drink, not dangerous, but it allowed the researchers to track the amount of leaky gut before and after an intervention with probiotics. So let's break down what I found to be a super interesting study, the protocol, what they found, and what lessons we can take away for how to best use probiotics to reduce leaky gut. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, providing practical, science-based insights into health. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. Why leaky gut matters? Well, it depends on what you're suffering with, but a different paper, this one by Leach and colleagues, found any of the following symptoms have a 36 to 88% likelihood leaky gut could be implicated. Digestive, so gas, bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, reflux, but also systemic or inflammatory symptoms, fatigue, brain fog, poor mood, skin issues, and joint pain. Again, the prevalence ranges from 36 to 88%. However, it makes it something that I think we should be paying attention to. And why this is so important, why leaky gut is so relevant, is this syndrome predominantly occurs in the small intestine. And why does that matter? Well, over 90% of calories and nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. And ironically, paradoxically, when you have leaky gut, you have hyperpermeability, too much particle leaks through, but it's not leaking through in the right way. Therefore, people tend to be absorbing less nutrients, but also stimulating the immune system and causing an inflammatory response. So the good news here, as we'll outline in this study, is leaky gut is very able to be remedied. But just to set the stage of prevalence, 30-ish to 80-ish percent, and tied to a number of symptoms coming back to the importance of the small intestine for inflammation, caloric, and nutrient absorption. With that in mind, let's unpack this study. By the way, if this has been helpful, please comment, subscribe, and share this with one person you think it could help. Okay, let's set the context. I wanna quote the researchers here in terms of, well, why did they do this study? It seems obvious, but Let's sort of give the, the prelude up to this study. Quoting, the multi-strain probiotic, that's what they're looking at in this study, downregulated the response mediated through toll-like receptor 4 in vitro and in vivo. Toll-like receptor 4, we've discussed on the podcast in the past, is one of the chief receptors that regulates leaky gut. From their historical research, they found that either in animal data or in cell model data, they were able to downregulate this receptor and therefore likely leaky gut. So continuing with my quote, logically led us to want to evaluate the impact of the multi-strain probiotic on IBS symptoms in a clinical trial. And this is exactly the way science should be done. We start with an observation in animal data, in cell culture data, and then we want to replicate that in humans. And as you probably know, but just to make sure to call it out, oftentimes what looks good under the microscope or in animals doesn't look great in humans, which is why it's so important to run a clinical trial such as this. In this study, it was small, 27 patients, with IBS and with leaky gut. There was also no control group, so that's important to note. But they did do a good job of screening people who had prior antibiotics or used probiotics previously or had potentially confounding conditions like IBD, celiac, parasites, or other infections. And they confirmed the leaky gut via radionuclide tracers. So people had a drink before the study and after one month in the probiotic, and the amount of particles that could leak through was assessed. They were given 20 billion CFU of a blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And just as one quick aside here, this is not 
a proprietary special formula. It's your typical blend of about three lactobacillus species and three bifidobacterium species. Okay, so let's look at what they found. After one month, they found an 82% either improvement or resolution of leaky gut. Super exciting. Probably not surprising. Also probably not surprising that 96% of subjects reported being satisfied with their symptomatic improvement, whether this was abdominal pain, diarrhea, urgency, or quality of life. And particularly here, food avoidance and their social life, which I'm glad they commented on this because I've made remarks about this on the podcast in the past, that being careful to avoid inculcation about food fear is important and to try to spin or frame this information empoweringly and not lead people to have a unhealthy relationship with food is quite important. So I'm glad that they commented on the social aspect. They also looked at a different marker of leaky gut, serum zonulin. And they did not find that serum zonulin improved after the probiotic. So they found improvements in the radionuclide tracers. They found improvements in symptoms, right? 82% and 96%. But no improvement in serum zonulin. Now, serum zonulin is a validated marker, but it's important to understand that we're still learning how to use these tools, these assessment tools, and what correlation these biomarkers have with people's symptoms and with their health more generally. I'll refer you to what I found to be a very insightful conversation with Dr. Michael Camilleri from the Mayo Clinic, where we went pretty deep into assessments for leaky gut and how we should be bridled with not using these markers to tell us what to do clinically. Said simply, many, many, many more people will see their symptoms improve, then we'll see a lab marker improve. I'll give you another example, which is super well-established. The findings on x-rays or MRIs have very little correlation with people's musculoskeletal pain or dysfunction, nor do they change the rehab plan that someone would use and potentially benefit from. So all this just to give us a healthy respect and perspective regarding testing and the limitations at least that functional testing has. I'm not saying if your conventional gastroenterologist suspects an ulcer or wants you to do a screening for colorectal cancer, for example, to disregard those. But what I am saying is that if you're having food reactivity or other digestive or uh, systemic symptoms with no known cause, the promise that something like a zonulin assessment will give you the answers is really a specious promise that we should be cautious of. And thankfully, this really simple model of people's symptoms being the barometer for, are you doing the right thing, is what we should be focusing our attention on. And let me make this case briefly in terms of the wealth of research we have demonstrating that probiotics improve symptoms. A network meta-analysis of 43 randomized control trials showing efficacy with probiotics for IBS. A 2021 meta-analysis of 36 clinical trials showing efficacy with probiotics for inflammatory bowel disease. A 2020 meta-analysis of 15 randomized control trials showing improvements in constipation. A 2021 network meta-analysis of 22 randomized control trials showing improvements in eczema and a separate 2022 systematic review showing improvements in seasonal allergy, and even a 2023 meta-analysis of 11 clinical trials showing improvements in rheumatoid arthritis. And the good news does not stop there. A 2023 umbrella meta-analysis of 87 randomized control trials showing improvements with, with a large effect size for depression, and even Cognition, a 2023 systematic review of 10 clinical trials showing for those with mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, or even in those who are healthy, a improvement in cognition from using probiotics. The good news here is we have a wealth of high quality research 
showing benefits for probiotics. And to come back to the initial point, we should be careful with how much we're using biomarkers to tell us if we are on the right track. I just want to quickly mention the meta protocol that we've been developing now for about two years, which by the way, has changed just in the past few months based upon the research being published. However, if you look at all this data, hundreds of clinical trials, how can we look for simple and effective commonalities across all these trials so as to give you a protocol you can use at home? And this is, again, the meta protocol that we've been developing here for a number of years. There are, generally speaking, as a framework, three types of probiotics. The study we covered today, the CHIEF study, they used the blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. They used it for one month, and they used it at a dose of 20 billion. That's what you're seeing in part here. Our lactobifidal blend recommendation is a dose from one to 50 billion per day. Anywhere in there is justifiable. And we recommend a minimum duration of two to three months so as to be able to assess the full efficacy because you are seeing a number of trials that will report improvements in as little as two weeks. But oftentimes you don't see people hit a pinnacle of improvement until somewhere between two to in some cases even six months. So this is why the minimum duration, not the maximum duration, but the minimum duration would be two to three months. Now, second to that, a healthy fungus Saccharomyces boulardii, and we're about to add to this a different Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Both of these are healthy fungal probiotics at a dose of 10 to 15 billion per day, again, for two to three months. And finally, the third type of probiotic, a soil-based probiotic, anywhere from two to six billion CFU per day for two to three months. You can start with any one of these, and you only need to use just one formula. Our posit is if you combine all three, this may give you better efficacy than just one probiotic alone. But as I've said many times in the past, this is our speculation. This has not yet been robustly demonstrated. So in conclusion, in those with symptoms, remember there's a 36 to 88% likelihood that your symptoms may have leaky gut as a component of what's driving them. Some evidence is showing improvements in leaky gut with probiotics. A lot of evidence is showing improvements in symptoms with probiotics. And my opinion is the most accurate way to assess if any gut intervention, including probiotics, is working for you is to monitor your symptoms. And if you are going to use a probiotic, take it one step at a time, listen to your body, and the meta protocol gives you a simple starting point to do so. Okay, well, again, I hope you will comment, share this, and subscribe, and you'll try a probiotic, and again, let us know in the comments how it goes for you. 